I hate, I hate, I hate to interrupt uh, a good lunch and good conversation, but I promise more good conversation. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the American Society of International Law, and I'm very pleased to be here as a co-sponsor of this luncheon. We're very grateful to the Federalist Society for inviting the American Society to participate in this event. And I want to say a special thanks to Gene Meyer and to Lee Otis for their uh, collaboration in this and in many other ventures. We, we enjoy very much working with the Federalist Society. We had a wonderful uh, co-sponsored uh, event at last year's ASIL annual meeting, and we look forward to having another one at this upcoming meeting. I also want to say a special thank you to Judge Joan Donahue from the International Court of Justice, who is joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'll say a word about the American Society of International Law and then introduce our, our topic and our speakers. The American Society is the leading scholarly society dedicated to the study of international law. Our members hail from more than 100 countries and include the leading scholars and practitioners in international law. We are a nonpartisan educational institution and we do not take positions on matters of policy. Rather, we seek to provide a forum for an honest, open, rigorous exchange of views. And that's um, something I think we share with the Federalist Society and certainly something that we uh, look forward to fostering uh, today. There is uh, information about the society, about membership, and about our annual meeting at the table outside, and I invite you to take a look of, at that. Um, a significant preoccupation of the American Society of International Law and of international lawyers in the US is the relationship between international law and US domestic law. And there are a few topics or areas where that question is playing out more prominently these days in the courts, in the law reviews, in the blogs, in many of your heads, I'm sure, um, than with respect to the alien tort statute. And so uh, the ATS raises important questions about the definition of international law, particularly customary international law, how it is formed, how US courts are to determine and apply it, and who is susceptible to ATS liability? What are the limits on liability under this potentially far-reaching uh, statute? The ATS is the subject, of course, this term of the Kiobel case before the Supreme Court and a growing docket of litigation in the lower courts with conflicting approaches emerging there. So it is, it is fitting that that is our topic uh, today. And we are lucky to have two rising stars in the international law field to debate the issues and, and frame it all for us. I'm happy to say that they are both active members of the American Society of International Law. Um, professor Eugene Kontorovich, on my left, is a professor of law at the Northwestern University School of Law. His research spans the fields of constitutional law, international law, and law and economics. He is also one of the leading experts on maritime piracy, universal jurisdiction, and international criminal law, subject, subjects on which he has published with the American Society of International Law, and on which he has been called on to advise lawyers in historic piracy trials around the world. He is working on a book entitled Justice at Sea, Piracy and the Limits of International Criminal Law, under contract with Harvard University Press. He has also written and lectured extensively about the legal aspects of the Israel-Arab conflict. He holds undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Chicago, where he also taught for two years as a visiting professor. After law school, he clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the US Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. This year, Professor Kontorovich is a resident member of the Institute for Advanced Study um, School of Social uh, Science at Princeton. And I, I think I can spill some beans here, although it won't be officially announced until the Federalist Society Student Symposium at Stanford later uh, this spring. Rumor has it that he is this year's recipient of the Federalist Society's Bachor Award, given each year to a faculty member under 40 for excellence in scholarship. Congratulations. I'm pleased also to uh, introduce on my right Professor Stephen Vladek, who is a professor of law and associate dean for scholarship at American University Washington College of Law. His teaching and research focuses on federal jurisdiction, constitutional law, national security law, and international criminal law. A nationally recognized expert on the role of the federal courts in responding to terrorism, he was part of the legal team that successfully challenged the Bush administration's use of military tribunals at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, in Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, and has co-authored amicus briefs in a host of other major lawsuits, many of which 
have challenged the U.S. government's surveillance and detention of terrorism suspects. Professor Vladek is a, a co-editor of Aspen Publishers' leading national security law ca casebook, has drafted reports on related topics for a wide range of organizations, including the First Amendment Center of the Constitution Project and the ABA Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Professor Vladek has won awards for his teaching, his scholarship, and his service to uh, the law school. He is a senior editor of the peer-reviewed Journal of National Security Law and Policy, a senior contributor to Lawfare Blog, and a member of the Executive Committee of the Section of Federal Courts of the ALS. A 2004 graduate of Yale Law School, where he won a number of moot court and writing prizes, Professor Vladek clerked for Judge Marsha Burson of the Ninth Circuit and Judge Rosemary Barquette of the Eleventh Circuit. He received his BA from Amherst College in 2001, something that as a Williams alum I will not hold against him. We won the football game this year. Um, and uh, very much look forward to the conversation these two will have. Let me say um, a word about our format. You can see we're relaxed and uh, informal up here. Um, we will begin by discussing a series of questions among ourselves for 45 or 50 minutes and then open it up for input and question um, and uh, debate with the floor. So uh, let me begin then um, by posing a question uh, first to Professor Kantorovich. And I think it's appropriate that we start by laying a, a legal baseline with the Supreme Court's uh, decision in, in Sosa versus Alvarez-McCain um, and lay the groundwork for the current debate unfolding on ATS. Um, Professor Kantorovich, um, give us your interpretation of post-Sosa uh, law that is, what exactly is the standard for establishing an international norm in alien tort statute litigation? That is, how much precedent, agreement, specificity about the content of the norm is necessary? Thank you. So Sosa was a bit of a schizophrenic case, uh, which, like Santa Claus, brought everyone everything they wished for. And it both said that the ATS is just a uh, jurisdictional statute, but at the same time, it said it gives rise to causes of action. Uh, how does one identify the causes of action? So it, it gave, I wouldn't call it a test, but let's say uh, a hint that it has to be international law norms that are definite and universal uh, to the degree that piracy, offenses against ambassadors, and violations of self, uh, safe conducts were in the 18th century. So they need to uh, possess the same degree of definitiveness and the same degree of universal acceptance. And I think it's useful to point out that definitiveness and universal acceptance are conjunctive. That is to say, it has to, there has to be a definition which is universally accepted rather than three different de definitions, each of which together would, uh, would, 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 would enjoy some acceptance. Uh, so how exactly, how high a standard is this? What's it mean to be definitive and uh, well-defined and universally accepted? So it's very hard to tell from subsequent uh, case law from post Sosa cases in the federal courts because it seems that the federal courts have basically carried on doing what they were doing before Sosa and the ones that liked the ATS continue to be generous in causes of action and the ones that don't uh, are, are, uh, continue to not be generous and we have not really clearly established in the case law what exactly this means and the kind of question that one would wonder is what kind of crimes would fall outside of this? What kind of international law offenses? environmental crimes, medical experimentation, apartheid, cruel and inhumane treatment, what is not sufficiently defined or does not have a def definition that is universally agreed upon that would fall outside uh, of, of, the, of the SOSA standard. So again, the ATS cases have not really built, uh, built up a definition, but fortunately, just a year after uh, SOSA, the Supreme Court itself has given us a great example of how to approach this question. And there's a methodological question also. How does one begin to establish how definitive a norm is and how well agreed upon it is? And we actually get a, a perfect illustration of this in an entirely different context, and it's with uh, some irony that I now enlist in my cause uh, Hamdan, uh, in, which, uh, in, in which Professor Vladek uh, worked. So one of the many parts of Hamdan was the uh, holding of the plurality that the offense charged by the military commission, conspiracy to commit war crimes, was not actually a violation of the laws of war. Now, why was this a question that they felt they had to address? So here's how they got there. 
is that the, the military commissions are, are exercising power under the offenses clause, under Congress's power to define and punish piracies and felonies on the high seas and what's relevant here, offenses against the law of nations. That's the source of the constitutional power. Thus, it needs to be something that really exists in the law of nations. And then they actually considered. They didn't say, we're going to trust Congress, we're going to trust the, uh, we're not, we're going to trust the military commissions. They then began to examine uh, whether it was indeed an uh, uh, offense against the law of nations. Why is this relevant for the ATS? Why is this something worth talking about? Because the ATS is, in the opinion of courts that have uh, suggested an Article I basis, also an exercise of the same constitutional power in exactly the same form. So these are both situations where Congress has actually not defined an offense, but rather delegated to another branch of government, the executive and military commissions in uh, Hamdan and the judiciary here, the task of defining. Uh, so it needs to fall within the, uh, within, w within the law of nations per the Constitution. What did Hamdan say about this? Well, they adopted a rather rigorous test. They said the precedent must be plain and unambiguous. Plain and unambiguous. And I think the most important word in that phrase is precedent. They looked around and they said, have there been any other cases where someone was tried for conspiracy per se, uh, and even though there were other uh, trials for people involved in war crimes and for things that might substantively look like the same kind of conduct, they did not really identify cases where charge was uh, conspiracy to, uh, to commit these crimes, and they said, we, we, we cannot proceed. And on uh, remand, there has been extensive briefing by international uh, legal scholars to uh, the military commissions who say, look, you cannot recognize this, uh, this charge of conspiracy because you cannot find any cases in international law uh, that, clear, that clearly do this, and you really need a clear line of pre-existing cases this is not the occasion on which to invent, synthesize, or take steps forward, because the law of nations, in the law of na define and punish clause, refers to pre-existing uh, law of nations. But if you, if you just look at Hamdan, which I encourage you to do, the plurality discussion of all conspiracy. All 177 pages? Yeah, exactly. All, so there's many pages. And on this question of conspiracy, they spend like a, a good deal of time. And the military commission uh, opinion uh, on remand spends tens of dozens and dozens of pages on thoroughly sifting uh, the international precedents to look for definiteness in a way which isn't even really attempted in, um, AT, uh, in ATS cases. Uh, now, no ATS case has uh, realized the relevance uh, of, of Hamdan, but Hamdan is the exact same question as, as, the, court is, as the court has given lower courts uh, to, sol to solve. Uh, now, another thing, uh, the crucial importance of Hamdan, it turns out that Hamdan is the first time in the history of the country that an exercise of government authority has been struck down for defining something that, go, that is not an offense, for going beyond the limits of the offenses clause of the Constitution. That shows that it is possible. The offenses clause is a real limit. But by the way, it's not the first time the question has arisen. The Supreme Court, uh, in opinions by Justice Story and Justice Marshall, in uh, a bunch of piracy cases, 1818 and 1820, Smith and Furlong, recognized that if Congress were to define as piracy something which was not clearly established as piracy in international law, that would be a constitutional problem. Now, in the ATS, Congress hasn't defined anything. Rather, they have delegated the entire defined power. And when you think about even in a world of modern administrative law and acceptance of broad delegation, this is a delegation of unusual scope. Right? The Constitution says, define and punish offenses against the law of nations. What's the scope of the ATS? Offenses against the law of nations. It's as if Congress had created a federal agency and said, regulate commerce. Now, there are agencies which, in effect, do something similar. Uh, but usually, there are limiting principles. And one way which I think it's useful to interpret SOSA, I think this delegation would be quite problematic were one not to find some limiting principle to cabinet. And the limiting principle was provided in SOSA. SOSA, you can, you can think of as a kind of narrowing construction. It needs to be something that's already clearly established in international law. You can point to the cases. You're not just synthesizing things. You are not boldly venturing where previous, uh, previous courts applying international law kind of thought to go but did not actually tread. Uh, and I kind of uh, described this approach, and this is uh, described in my forthcoming article, Discretion, Delegation, and Defining in the Constitution's Law of Nations Clause in Northwestern in a few months, SOSA on steroids. That is to say, 
Sosa states its rule as a rule of statutory interpretation, which is surely the sound approach. They were dealing with a statute start with congressional intent. But Congress could not have intended anything else. Con uh, the, when a court considers whether to recognize an offense, let's say medical experimentation, any particular specifications of cruel and inhuman treatment, uh, the, it's, not, it's not just a statutory question, it's a constitutional question. Is this actually done in international law? And precedent is a, is a, is a, is a, is a uh, tough standard to uh, meet. I'll say a few more words on uh, something which will let me segue into my... Uh, uh, my, next, my, my next subject. So Hamdan suggests a high test. Hamdan also suggests that it's a test of constitutional dimension, which means if we're not sure. Rio Tinto is a great example of how you could not be sure. In the en banc opinion in the Ninth Circuit, everyone agreed that something, or the majority agreed, a narrow majority agreed, that something in the, uh, in the complaint was a definite violation of universally agreed norms, but they split three ways on what the definite norm was and how it was defined. So in it seems if it's a constitutional issue, in cases of doubt, one has to resolve against recognizing uh, a norm because of constitutional doubt. Now, the question is, what does Sosa's rule apply to? Clearly, it applies to causes of action, and that's what we've been talking about uh, so far. What about so-called second-order questions, things other than what would be needed, let's say, maybe for a well-pleaded uh, complaint, other than the actual definition of the uh, international delict? And this, gets us, this is going to be relevant to the question of cor corporate li liability, but is, is broader. I'm very sympathetic to the notion that the define and punish clause contemplates gap filling by the courts in, in cases where the cause of action is created. Because indeed, at the Constitutional Convention, one of the objections to, um, one of the reasons for inserting the define power, before Congress, in the first draft, Congress was just going to punish offenses. And then Congress was given the power to define them too because, as Governor Morris said, international law was too deficient and vague to provide a rule, which would be a great title for a book about international law, by the way, deficient and vague. But what they meant was it didn't specify. There's a lot unspecified, and you need to make cohate what, what is incohate. So, and I think there's clearly room for that, and this will clearly go to questions of, for example, damages, which are generally not addressed in any, in any great, de great detail. But, the question, but that still does not tell us what is a secondary issue a second order issue, and what isn't a second order issue. Often things that we would think of as not the cause of action are actually dealt with by international law. For example, many of these uh, offenses involve universal jurisdiction. So jurisdiction, whether an international law norm has universal jurisdiction or not, that uh, international law speaks to that. What about attempt? The, a series of piracy cases in the, uh, in the Fourth Circuit, two district court cases, uh, went different ways on whether attempted to commit piracy actually falls within the international law crime of piracy. This was just last year and will be decided by the Fourth Circuit. And the question, they only looked to international law. They all agreed that whether or not attempted piracy is or is not piracy is a question of the international law definition of piracy. Some defenses are filled in by international law, uh, immunity and whatnot. And international law often speaks to questions like who can be held liable, individuals, nations, yes or no. Um, so it's not obvious that corporate liability would indeed be a second-order question if one, is to, uh, if, if one is to think that second-order questions could be filled in. Uh, Before we get to corporate liability, yes. though, I'm going to turn to Professor you. Vladek, if I can, and ask mm -hmm. him to give us his take on the post-SOSA state of affairs. Um, in particular, maybe you can respond to the yeah. um, uh, suggestion of the relevance of Hamdan. Sure. So um, let me just say first that, that Eugene, I love the idea of an article titled Sosa on Steroids. I'm not sure most people will think that you mean Sosa versus Alvarez Machain. Um, <laughs> but, but that might only increase its profile. So um, um, let me say, I, I can probably sort of cut to the chase pretty quickly because I think Eugene and I actually are largely in agreement about what Sosa means and, and about not just what it actually, how it actually catches out in the lower courts, but also the sort of all things to all people quality. I, I suspect that you know, part of why that part of Sosa is unanimous is because Justice Souter was intentionally trying to be quite pragmatic about how this would be implemented by the lower courts and trying to sort of leave these questions open while clarifying that the completely sort of universalist approach wasn't going to fly. Um, with regard to Hamdan, you know, I'm, I'm heartened uh, that, that Eugene sees this as being of a piece. I, I want to draw one important distinction, even though it's against probably my own interests, because I think it matters. Um, in Hamdan itself, when the Supreme Court heard Hamdan in 2006, they weren't actually interpreting the Law of Nations Clause. They were interpreting 
Article 21 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, why does that matter? Article 21 didn't refer to the law of nations, it referred to the laws of war. Right, so Article 21 actually said you can have military commissions for offenses or offenders who are tribal by military commission under the laws of war. So when Justice Stevens is talking about conspiracy, um, it's in the context of interpreting the phrase laws of war in Article 21. Um, I think one could make a case that the standard wouldn't necessarily have to be different um, as between the phrase laws of war and law of nations. I, just, I, don't, I, I resist Eugene's suggestion that Hamdan was sort of a test of constitutional dimension. Um, I think Justice Stevens would be very surprised to learn that. Um, but the larger point I think is right, right, which is to say um, if we are going to have a serious debate about how courts ascertain the meaning of the phrase law of nations, it's important to realize that this is not then just a conversation about the alien tort statute. Um, that insofar as the ATS says, you know, torts committed in violation of the law of nations, um, the other example is the one Eugene posits, is the define and punish clause of Article 1. And even though Hamdan, the Supreme Court decision, didn't raise this issue, Hamdan actually, which is still going, mm -hmm. does now raise this issue. Um, because in 2006, after the Supreme Court decision, Congress codified a series of 28 substantive offenses, um, triable by military commissions. Conspiracy was one of them. Providing material support to terrorism was one of them. Um, and the question raised in Hamdan's subsequent military commission proceeding was whether Congress had thereby exceeded its Article I power by subjecting to trial by military commission offenses that arguably weren't recognized by the law of nations. Um, the trial court said no, albeit rather summarily. Uh, just last year, the Court of Military Commission Review affirmed the trial court. Uh, this case is now on appeal to the D.C. Circuit. Um, so this issue is actually going to come up again um, from the other direction that Eugene posits. And I think it's worth noting that wherever one comes down on the question, of how the phrase law of nations should be uh, uh, given content, and more importantly, who should give it content. I'm hard pressed to see how your answer would be different, depending on whether it's the phrase law of nations in the alien tort statute, or law of nations in the define and punish clause. Um, to my mind, both are sort of ripe for judicial construction. Um, and I think Eugene is right that the relevant standard should be sort of definiteness and some degree of universality, but that cuts both ways. Um, and I think that's part of why Kiobel is such an interesting case, because lurking in the background, um, whether the justices like it or not, is the military commissions um, and the constitutionality of the Military Commissions Act itself. Okay. Great. Well, with that backed up, then maybe I can start um, pushing further then in the direction of Kiobel and, and the particular question of corporate liability um, and ask you, Professor Vladek, to you know, lead us in, <laughs> into that thicket and uh, tell us what your views are uh, about corporate liability under the ATS and how do, how do we find the law? Sure. So let me, let me sort of say something that might be disappointing at first, which is that I think there's a very good chance the Supreme Court isn't going to answer this question, um, or at least isn't going to answer it now. Um, so the, the irony of Kiobel is that it's a weird procedural vehicle for this issue because uh, Shell, uh, the original plaintiff in the district court, never actually raised corporate liability or the absence of corporate liability under the ATS as a defense in the district court. Uh, that didn't stop the Second Circuit because the Second Circuit concluded that corporate liability is jurisdictional um, under the ATS. Um, I think whatever we think about corporate liability, it's very hard to look at the ATS and say that the existence vel non of corporate liability is a jurisdictional question. Um, and so it's entirely possible that the court could, you know, duck on the ground that the Second Circuit improperly reached the issue in the first place. So just with that out there as the, this may go away, um, Assuming it doesn't. Um, so there are a couple of layers to the question. The first question is, how do we ascertain which classes of defendants can be held liable under the ATS? Um, and what the Second Circuit assumed in its decision in Kiobel is that just as we look to international law for the norms and for the conduct that the alien tort statute provides a cause of action for, so too we should look to international law um, for the modes of liability, for the classes of individuals who can be held liable, and so on. Um, and so that was the sort of crux of the, the logic behind the opinion and the holding that under international law, there is no clear standard that comes remotely near the SOSA test for holding corporations liable for these kinds of, of human rights violations. Um, right? And that was sort of the gist of, of the second strict analysis. Now, there are a couple of, of, of ways one can quibble with it, and indeed that I would quibble with it. Right? The first is, um, I'm not even sure that they necessarily read international law correctly. 
Um, right? So there's actually a fairly powerful argument that's been made, for example, in the DC Circuit's opinion in Doe versus Exxon, um, that international law actually isn't quite as clearly against corporate liability as the Second Circuit made it out to be. But the far more, the far more I think, compelling argument is that the question of who can be held liable um, is not meant to be a question uh, that should be governed by international law under the Alien Tort Statute, right? Congress could have done that. Congress could have written a statute that says, you know, and liability shall be determined based on the law of nations, right? Congress could have said a tort committed in violation of the law of nations where the defendant could have been liable under the law of nations. Um, the problem is Congress didn't, and so I'm hard pressed to see why we wouldn't apply ordinary principles, um, which we usually borrow from either, you know, common law or federal common law to answer that question. So I think that the short version is I doubt the court, well, I shouldn't say I doubt. I think it's quite possible the court will duck the issue, but I think on the merits, you know, one would first have to say either, yes, we look exclusively to international law and the Second Circuit correctly read international law, which I think is a stretch, or international law is part of the calculus, but it's not all of it. And I think that's the far more compelling uh, uh, take. So we'll see. Okay, Professor Gontorovich, before I cut you off, I think you were headed toward suggesting that international law was where we look for this liability question. So, yeah, so I, I think international, I think there's a strong case to be made that international law, I don't think this is an answer that's written down anywhere, but uh, again, in, uh, in Hamdan, for example, we, we, didn't, we didn't say, well, we know that uh, certain kinds of war crimes being illegal combatants, that's international law. Conspiracy, we will look to domestic conspiracy principles. In the piracy cases, we don't say piracy is against international law, but aiding and abetting or attempting um, uh, accessory to piracy, this we will look to our uh, d domestic ones. And these are all things which get to the question of incohate, li uh, in uh, incohate liability, uh, uh, and it seems that international law does, uh, does provide the standard there. It now, again, I think that the uh, people who are fond of the ATS need to take the good with the bad. Uh, presumably, you want to look to international law for jurisdiction, at least sometimes in these cases, because if you look to U.S. basic principles of jurisdiction for all these cases, right, jurisdiction is not part of the cause of action. It's not part of the definition of the offense. Uh, and so if you just look to U.S. law, well, generally, if there's no U.S. nexus, then the United States does not have, uh, does not, does not have jurisdiction and would not be uh, involved in, in, in these things. So uh, it seems to me that something which defines the, uh, which parties can be reached for liability uh, could, well be part, uh, could well be something to which we look to international law for. Now, what's international law actually say? So I think it's very thin on uh, having any basis for, interna uh, for, um, for corporate liability. Uh, lately, to my, uh, to my great joy, uh, people have been citing pirates uh, and other kind of maritime predators as a basis for, uh, as an early example of corporate liability. Uh, I th and uh, this was done in the Firestone case by Judge Posner, uh, and it was done in the legal historian's brief in one of these, uh, in one of the, in one of these uh, cases, uh, Federal Circuit cases. Um, I think that's quite wrong. Uh, pirate vessels, unlike merchant vessels, were partnerships. That is to say, pirate vessels were wholly owned by the pirate crew, uh, and they were partnerships. Indeed, piracy law reflected this, because pirates, even the, the cook, the guy who was downstairs and didn't even know what was going on upstairs, uh, they were all equally liable in a way that we would call today in, in international criminal law a joint criminal enterprise, uh, rather than, corp uh, rather than uh, this was not a corporation. Merchant ships were actually owned by absentee syndicates, the distinctive feature of pirate vessels, which actually allowed for their famous degree of greater democ democ democracy on the ship, was that they were owned by the uh, people on the ship themselves, and the liability against this entity was purely in rem. That is to say, the proceedings against the entity were against the proceedings against a, a ship, and in rem is quite different from, uh, from corporate liability. Obviously, the, 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 there's a maximum to it. It's used to... Uh, uh, um, there were not damage actions against the pirates separate to the in-rem proceedings. Um, but again, I think the stronger argument for, uh, for corporate liability would be to say, why not decide this as federal common law, and we are not strangers to corporate liability. Um, why, why, why not do that? But I think even if one were to say, even if one were to say it was a question of federal common law, that, by the way, does not mean that the answer to that question is uh, the answer to that question is corporate liability. Now, the courts who have gone this route and said federal common law, which is how the courts did, 
the DC circuit, uh, the second circuit dissent, how they go when they want to uh, say there is such a thing as corporate liability. They make basically three arguments. First of all, they say it furthers the objectives of international law to have corporate liability. That's really quite shocking. Uh, the, I see nothing in the ATS as creating a mandate for federal courts to create a common law to maximally fulfill the objectives of international law writ large. And indeed, when you look at the purposes of the ATS, like the define and punish clause itself, the purposes were to vindicate US interests when a law of nations uh, offense implicated the United States by being done by American nationals or committed in the US such that a failure to allow redress would lead to a diplomatic incident. So the, the purpose of the ATS and the constitutional provision from which it stems was never to effectuate international law, as in bring the universe closer to the teleological state international law envisions. It was to allow the United States to tell foreign diplomats when things happened here, look, they have a remedy, uh, don't, don't make a big, uh, big incident out of it. And certainly it is not in keeping with the instruction of SOSA to be narrow and limited, to think that the federal common law you can craft could be dedicated to fulfilling the objectives of international law. Uh, another argument is that it would be weird for corporations to have impunity. So uh, some judges have said, look, federal, a co company could just go and commit genocide and there's nothing anyone could do about it because of corporate liability. So first of all, there's lots of things that could be done. First of all, there's criminal proceedings, civil proceedings against the uh, individuals involved, and there's every country in the world and where this happened that could deal with it. Uh, that could deal with it. ATS suits are not you know, the only possible uh, vindication um, of, of, uh, of genocidal corporations. Uh, and finally, uh, an argument which I think may be the strongest argument on the score is, look, we are not strangers to corporate liability. Why should we say no corporate liability when we say corporate liability everywhere else? And the answer is, well, this isn't everywhere else. The only reason we have this cause of action is because law of nations has been imported in a very limited way through the ATS for a very narrow set of causes of action that we take from international law. We take from international law means other countries are also supposedly doing the same thing. And in this case, we should look to international, we should look as a prudential matter to international law for norms of corporate liability out of comedy concerns, out of forum shopping concerns. Uh, and it would be very odd if the rest of the world is not recognizing uh, corporate liability. If we, of course, do recognize corporate liability, this would uh, re result in forum shopping and other uh, unatt unattractive phenomenon. So federal common law is usually used when you have a norm that arises from some kind of domestic context and then you could look at it that way. But if the norm itself is external, uh, then looking to uh, um, international law and foreign law indeed, where corporate liability is not particularly well established, uh, that uh, would, would, would make more sense. Can I ask, can I, when you say corporate liability is not particularly well established, I mean, there's a lot hiding beneath that, 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 that phrase, right? Because there, I mean, so for example, the, the federal government, which has filed an amicus brief on support in support mm -hmm. of Piovo in the Supreme Court, makes a series of arguments that I think are quite compelling, right? First is, there actually are specific countries, and they identify them, um, in which corporations can be held criminally liable for yes. certain offenses, right? Even though we are not typically uh, uh, in, that, in that ballpark, right? Um, but second, the other point they make is, well, wait a second. Why is the assumption that countries must make specific accommodations for corporate liability, as opposed to assuming that the answer is persons, including juridical persons, are generally liable unless they're specifically excluded, right? So why is the baseline that we have to show that there's a consensus for corporate liability as opposed to showing that there's a consensus for excluding corporations from liability to which they'd otherwise be subject, right? I mean, I think that's, that's a relevant question here. Yeah, I, I, I think from the federal common law, I mean, from the SOSA perspective, obviously, we want clear, clear evidence. But from the, the federal common, uh, from the federal law, co common law perspective, you want to see, the real question is, what are countries actually doing? Not do they exclude it, do they include it? Are there countries where corporations are being held liable for these violations of international law as corporations and the shareholders are on the hook? I think the answer is no to that. Now, I mean, part of this, there's a, there's a kind of emperor has no clothes uh, aspect to this. One of the confusing, one of the reasons people are so desperate for gap fillers, why are there these gaps? Because the underlying irony is there are not countries which allow this kind of broad international human rights litigation in their courts, certainly against foreign countries. The ATS is basically unique as a vehicle of uh, c general vehicle of civil redress. So the who else would we look at? Well, even for the question of civil suits in general, there isn't much precedent. But the question is, what do you do with that? Do you say, oh, we're alone in allowing this? in entertaining these kind of suits. So now we have to make up a whole set of rules for how to govern them, 
or if there's no clear foreign practice, we're going to be very cautious about that, either because of constitutional concerns more, or more prudential uh, concer concerns vo uh, voiced in Sosa. And I, th I think we disagree about sort of what a federal court applying federal common law would necessarily be looking to, right, and trying to ascertain how to sort of cash out corporate liability in that context. But I think we agree that it's a question of federal common law informed by but not governed by. Oh, no, we don't agree. I was arguing in the alternative. Uh, no, well, okay. I, I, uh, I, th I, think that, uh, I, I, th I think that it's a question of the law of, of, law of nations, probably. But even if it were a, federal, a question of federal common law, that, yes. That, then but, so then, but so then would it be your view that in, in tort suits under the Federal Tort Claims Act, um, because the conduct at issue is all about state law, there would be no federal defense, there would be no federal common law defenses under the Federal Tort Claims Act? No, so defense is okay. So again, where you draw the line is, is a good question. And by the way, even in, uh, even in the ATS case, some, some defenses are drawn from international law, sovereign immunity, mm -hmm. etc. So where you draw the line is unclear, but I think the relationship of federal to state and to this vague, vague international law uh, is, is, not, is not exactly... Congruent. It may not be congruent. I guess I, I'm just I'm 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 taking I'm I'm sort of harkening back to your point about how we assess liability based on sort of how we assess the where where the norm comes from in the first place. Right? Mm -hmm. So if the norm's coming from international law, we should look at international law. I'm not actually sure that maps out completely onto how we ordinarily look at tort law domestically. That's well. This is not an ordinary domestic. This is not an ordinary tort. It's a law, it's a violation of. I mean, the word is in tort only against the law of nations, but tort just describes the civil nature of the. Proceeding and the real norm is a violation of uh, international law, often derivative largely of criminal law violations. Let me chase a, uh, an idea that you um, put out, uh, Professor Kantorovich, about um, maybe the uniqueness of this statute and um, and our its potential universal application. Um, and you've written um, some reservations about about that um, the application of the Alien Tort Statute as a universal jurisdiction. Um, statute. And so um, maybe you can help develop that idea a little bit and um, you know, answer specifically whether the statute should or, um, or must uh, be applied um, in suits between aliens, um, that is, as a universal jurisdiction so vehicle. Suit, yeah, suits between aliens are obviously at first glance uh, anomalous and uh, generally not encountered in other contexts in federal courts. There is no alien alien diversity. So there has to be something about the ATS that would authorize uh, these, these suits. And again, this is an area where we don't do what is urged for uh, corporate liability. We don't look to domestic common law principles. Fe domestic federal law common, common law principles clearly would say you don't get involved in disputes between two Paraguayans for things that happened in Paraguay. Why would you get involved in that? Because, they, ah, international law makes this the th kind of thing in the category of which international law creates a special jurisdictional class, universal jurisdiction. So there is such a thing as universal jurisdiction in international law. It does not just apply to piracy. It applies to a few more uh, offenses than that. But I think, again, based on the principles in SOSA uh, and on the define and punish clause, any universal jurisdiction exercised by US courts under the define and punish clause has to fit within universal jurisdiction in international law. I think you see this already in the Define and Punish Clause itself. The Define and Punish Clause says piracies and felonies on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. What's the point of saying piracies if you're also going to say felonies and offenses against the law of nations? So that's a triple redundancy, as William Sapphire would say, a case for the squad, squad, squad. Uh, so it's, uh, that is, a piracy is both a felony on the high seas and a violation of the law of nations. It's singled out, I believe, in part to suggest that, it's, that in that case, there you can try piracy, qua piracy, under the, what was then the unique jurisdictional regime for that, but don't think you could go doing that for other things. And indeed, when uh, in the early 19th century there was some suggestion of extending universal jurisdiction to other kinds of crimes, other kinds of violence on the high seas and the slave trade, the uh, response of Congress was, well, we can't do that because that goes, beyond what the, uh, uh, that goes beyond the law of nations and thus beyond our Article 1, Section 10 powers. How does that get us to, to the ATS? Again, the ATS is uh, supposedly an exercise of the uh, define and punish clause. However, courts are not particularly sensitive, despite Ju Justice Breyer's er caution that they should be, to whether an offense is an international law offense, international law norm. They're barely cautious about that. That's what we previously discussed, whether the norm exists. But then whether it also rises to the higher level 
of, uh, of a universal jurisdiction norm. And there is a lot of loose talk about use Kogan, so it must be universal jurisdiction, uh, or it's bad, so it must be use Kogan, so it must be universal jurisdiction. Clearly, this is a top-level question, which I would not say that universal jurisdiction could be exercised in, under the ATS, again, unless, again, we have clear precedent of these kind of offenses being held to be universally recognizable in, uh, in other fora, which is uh, rarely the case for uh, at least some of the offenses. Now, um, extraterritorial, extra, I'm going to touch briefly on extraterritoriality, which is a related issue. Uh, so this only recently arose in the Ninth Circuit, someone thought to say, quite belatedly. Uh, by the way, I agree with Steve about, uh, about Koibel, co that it's very hard to class this as a jurisdictional question, uh, corporate liability. But so, so, the, why would, so the ATS is a statute, and there's a general presumption, which the Supreme Court has recently reinforced, that statutes are not going to be interpreted to apply extraterritorially, absent clear statements, and so forth. Why should the ATS be an exception? And the an one answer to that is, well, it's about international law. Of course it's an exception. It has the word nations in it, law of nations, and that has to do with stuff that's abroad, and also pirates, and they were on the high seas, and that's also extraterritorial, and everyone knows uh, uh, encompassed pirates. So I don't think that's entirely responsive, because when you look to the purposes of the ATS, and that entire package of litigation, uh, the uh, ambassador's crimes in the first, in the first Crimes Act, uh, and uh, David Gawa has uh, described this quite, uh, quite well in some recent articles. The purpose was, uh, uh, was to, and uh, Belia and Clark have had a wonderful article about this, the purpose was clearly to get the U.S. off the hook for things for which the U.S. is responsible. If a, Belgian amb if a Belgian ambassador is beat up in Holland, that might violate the law of nations. That is an offense against the law of nations, but it is not one in, any, which, in which any way implicates the legal responsibility of the United States and was thus not within the scope of the purpose of the, either the constitutional provision or, most certainly, the statute. So I think all policy considerations would suggest all the normal uh, provisions of, against extraterritoriality apply. Uh, what about piracy? I think piracy really proves this point most strongly. Piracy was a universal jurisdiction crime in international law, yet when Congress in the First Crimes Act passed a statute making crimes by any person, piracy by any person on the high seas a federal crime, Nonetheless, Justice Marshall said, it says any person, but clearly they cannot mean any person. We're going to interpret this to mean any U.S. person. Because what, all of a sudden we're going to be doing piracies, British versus French, what do we care? That couldn't be what Congress meant. Uh, and indeed, Congress at that time revised the piracy statute a few years later to make it clear uh, that they did want to do that. But they did not revise the ATS, uh, of which they were equally aware, and that suggests that the normal presumptions against extraterritoriality and exercise of universal jurisdiction are not suspended when we get to international law. One quick follow-up, and then I want to hear from, from Professor Vladek, but um, what does your universal jurisdiction point say about a Kiobel scenario? I mean, are those universal jurisdiction offenses that are yeah, so the, the issue there? So, yeah, universal jurisdiction, as far as I understand it, is a different question from personal jurisdiction. It's a different question from whether a company might have minimum contacts with the United States right. uh, such that you could uh, satisfy a judgment. It goes, it, goes to the, uh, it goes to the nature of the offense. And an offense with a, fo a foreign corporation that happens to have U.S. operations abroad against foreigners, I would think would be something for which you would require universal jurisdiction. Again, I'm not, I don't have any particular opinion on what things are universally recognizable. I think it would be hard to say that things w for which you can find no other cases, medical experimentation, apartheid, things that don't really have a whole case law behind them, it would be hard to call those universally uh, cognizable, but, but, that, but that's a separate question from corporate liability. Because of the nature of the offense, not because of the corporate liability. Right. right. Okay. Professor Vladek. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think we might be getting to the point where our disagreements aren't quite as profound as they were on, on the last question. I mean, I think, you know, in one sense, SOSA actually may very well mitigate the fight about sort of alien alien suits in the U.S. courts, because to the extent that you know, SOSA recognizes that those small categories of claims that actually can be brought into the ATS really are federal common law, at least from a domestic law perspective, that has to be a sufficient federal interest right, to justify federal judicial intervention. You still have the, I mean, I don't want to, I want to sort of keep the personal jurisdiction and the universal jurisdiction question separate, but you, know, you still have the, 
the defendant will still have the right to show that he is not subject to being sued in a U.S. court. Um, that, may be, that may be belied by the extent to which a lot of these cases end, end up in default judgments. Um, but, you know, defendants can show up and say, we have no contact with the U.S. So, you know, presumably we can assume that in most of these cases there will be minimum contacts with the United States. That's how that case gets into federal court. And then the question becomes, if these offenses really are federal common law you know, uh, uh, substantive uh, norms, right, substantive sort of uh, uh, concerns. Why doesn't the United States have an interest, right, so long as, you know, the due process clause is, is respected with regard to the defendant um, in ensuring that these federal common law norms have a forum for being enforced um, when the defendant is properly subject to the jurisdiction of the federal court. So, you know, I, I, I share Eugene's skepticism about sort of a full universal jurisdiction approach in U.S. law. I'm just not sure if after SOSA, that's really where the ATS is. Um, and on the extraterritoriality question, you know, I think Eugene, Eugene's right in one sense, but I think it's important to remember that, the, that part of the animating concern was also offenses against aliens by U.S. persons, right, and by sort of U.S. defendants. And it's not at all clear to me why that would necessarily be limited to offenses within the domestic territory of the United States. It seems to me quite clearly um, that the U.S. would have an interest in cases where one of our citizens was responsible for a tort against a foreign national on foreign soil. Um, and so I don't know why extraterritorial application is so inconsistent with even that sort of revised understanding of why the ATS would have existed. So I, I don't think we're that far apart. I would just, I, these are sort of two quibbles. Yeah, if a U.S. national would create, I think, a U.S. A US nexus that would greatly re reduce my concerns. But oh, wait, on the extraterritoriality point or on the, or on the universal jurisdiction? Because those are separate, right? Or the, the universal jurisdiction right. point. They, they, are, they are separate, but extraterritoriality is partially a presumption of nexus-lessness, uh, which, which uh, U.S. national involvement could be uh, uh, gotten uh, around. But again, it seems to me a kind of Lincoln Mills bootstrapping to say, it's federal common law, and that makes it an interest. Uh, and the interest of calling it federal common law, c c common law can then allow it to be uh, applied universally. That is to say, its application as federal common law, you could say from the other direction, only goes as far as U.S. interests are implicated. That is the scope of the room to create federal common law that would be granted by a statute whose purpose is to get the U.S. off the hook. But so there's, so, so there's a body of substantive federal law in which the U.S. government has no interest? The interest depends on involving the United States, for which the United States would have. A, so it's not, a, it's not a purely substantive body of federal law. It's a body for answering country. For, uh, it's a body for adjudicating offenses which implicate the legal liability of the United States. I mean, I think, so I think you're right to invoke Lincoln Mills. I just think, you know, you call it bootstrapping. I call it, you know, the law of the land. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what our audience thinks. Um, we'll take... Questions as your hands go up. Just um, do we have a mic that people can use? Please speak into the mic and uh, maybe identify yourself. Uh, right here, Kurt. Thanks, and thanks for the great uh, discussion. Not, maybe not enough disagreement, so maybe I'll try to provoke you guys. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, the corporation violating the law of nations, but in a lot of these cases. Uh, they're really aiding and abetting cases, as far as I understand, not actual violations. So if we're in the world of federal common law, Steve, what weight should we give to the fact that the Supreme Court in the domestic arena is very reluctant to create aiding and abetting liability, absent some directive from Congress? So, I, I, uh, Kurt, I think that's a great question. And I actually, I think the aiding and abetting issue is a lot harder than the corporate liability question, um, which is why, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why I'm surprised they sort of jump on Kiobel. But, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, to my mind, that's where the rubber's going to hit the road here. Because I think if federal common law is the basis for sort of cashing out the liability uh, 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 questions, you know, there's going to I think courts are going to be very hard pressed to explain why, um, you know, absent some clear overriding reason why there should be aiding and abetting liability, you know, you'd allow it here. Let me just say again, though, and I, I suspect you and I agree on this, that also again, you know, piggybacks onto the military commission conversation, right? Because part of the Justice Department's argument, I'm sure, will eventually be that international law recognizes JCE3, right, Joint Criminal Enterprise, and so therefore the independent substantive offense of conspiracy isn't that different. Um, but that sort of, that's the very same, I think, kind of bootstrapping that, that, that would be a problem in the aiding and abetting. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm with you much more on the aiding and abetting side. Okay. Um, right here. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Steve, uh, George Brown from Boston College, uh, 
one of the things that strikes me when I read the ATS cases is how often the courts seem not to want to hear them. Uh, and regardless of the nature of the defendant, whether it's a public entity or a private entity, uh, and a large number of them seem to involve, of all things, the political question doctrine, which uh, many of us seem to think is dead, but uh, on the contrary, if you read a bunch of ATS cases, it's alive and well. And I wonder if you could give us a, some federal, sort of federal court sense on why it is that courts are invoking political question to avoid these hard uh, merits questions that uh, you two guys have debated today. Sure. I mean, I think, so, so it's, first of all, I mean, I, I don't think anyone should be surprised that courts invoke justiciability doctrines to, to avoid issues they think are hard. I mean, if, if one could apply justiciability doctrine to FERC orders, I think there would be no more, you know, federal power law. Um, the, you know, I, I think the short answer is courts are, are reluctant in these cases to look like they're interfering with foreign relations. And there's a concern that, spe- that, that the larger the case is, the more connected the defendant is to sort of the political situation in whatever country we're talking about. Um, the more that it seems to be running up right against foreign policy, I think the more courts are getting nervous and skittish about decisions that might in some ways influence our you know, diplomatic relations with the country in which the offenses allegedly took place. Um, I don't think that necessarily is to justify it, right? That's just to describe it. Um, you know, we've seen similar invocation of the political question doctrine in suits against contractors um, for offenses against U.S. persons uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I, I have a hard time squaring, you know, squaring it there, just as much as I have a hard time squaring rely, uh, reliance on the political question doctrine with, with the ATS side here. To the extent that the political question doctrine is sort of validly invoked in cases where there is a sort of sub-constitutional interference with foreign policy, um, I think it's understandable why this would be one of those classes of cases. I'm troubled by that body of law in general, and especially here. Um, but with regard to, you know, we may get a sense of whether the Supreme Court um, has any new, newfound love for the political question doctrine when it decides uh, MBZ versus Clinton this year. So, you know, maybe we'll have to reevaluate it then. Gene, do you have anything to add there? Oh, well, no. let someone we'll ask a question. Trey? Trey Childress, Pepperdine University School of Law. Uh, I have an observation, an invitation, and a question. The observation is, uh, I agree with Steve and uh, Eugene that uh, Kiobel isn't the perfect vehicle, although, as I understand it, the Rio Tinto case uh, in their interpretation is asked to be joined with the Kiobel case, and it, in fact, raises more appropriately in terms of the vehicle issue, the corporate liability issue, and as well raises aiding and abetting and, and flip questions and some, and some other things. So we, they may not get it to it in Kiobel, but they may get to it in Rio Tinto, if the, if the court wants to go in that direction. Uh, the invitation is that in March, uh, uh, Mike Ramsey, Chris Whitehawk, and I are doing a conference on related issues at UC Irvine, which everyone is, is welcome to attend, on uh, what happens when these human rights sort of cases are pled in state court. So if anyone's interested, let me know. And the question is this. I was intrigued at the end how both of you were focused on what interest the United States has in these cases. Uh, and it also strikes me that the cases that we think the most about, Pfizer, Firestone, uh, Rio Tinto, um, uh, Doe, have a strong, pretty strong U.S. nexus because they're U.S. corporations. And uh, in the world of choice of law, we would say that a state always has the interest in regulating the activity of its nationals, whether or not they occur domestically or abroad. And I wonder if that actually gives the United States some interest in ATS cases if these cases are pled against U.S. corporations. Yeah, I think we're in significant agreement here. I think it, to the extent it's a U.S. corporation, any, any kind of extraterritoriality, universal jurisdiction, et cetera, concerns would be completely removed. It's, it, it would clearly be a, a U.S. interest. And then the question would be things like the substantive definition of the offense, corporate liability, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, again, to the extent that it's a U.S. corporation, there may be less need for the ATS and a greater ability to use other causes of action, domestic tort causes of action, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. But there are plenty of corporations involved, Dutch Shell, et cetera. So some, but not all. Um. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly the federal government's interest is stronger in cases where these are corporations that do substantial business in the United States. I just, you know, to my mind, the relevant question isn't the government's interest in who the defendant is. It's the government's interest in the substantive law. And, and if SOSA is right, and there may be plenty of people in this room who think SOSA is wrong, uh, in one direction or the other. Um, you know, it seems to me that it has to follow that the, federal, that, that, that the United States has an interest in the federal common law that SOSA presupposes exists. 
regardless of whether the defendant is a U.S. corporation or not, even though obviously I think folks will get a lot less worked up um, in cases where the defendant had strong U.S. ties. Okay. Uh, in the back there. Hi. So my, my question goes a little far afield from the ATS, but it picks up you. I was surprised that you both agreed that the phrase law of nations in the Constitution means the same thing as the phrase law of nations in the ATS. Uh, and it ties in with something I've been just been thinking, thinking a lot about recently, which is, you know, the, certainly the way the framers understood the law of nations in the Constitution was very influenced by Vattel, who would have included treaties within the law of nations. That was one of his branches of the law of nations, right? So if, um, if the, first of all, what do you think of that? Does the phrase law of nations in the define and punish clause include treaties? Does that give Congress the power to punish offenses against treaties? And how does that then tie into ATS if it has the same meaning in the ATS there? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and I don't want to assume that. I don't want to assume anything. Uh, when Vattel says law of nations, he, law of nations at the time had two meanings. A kind of, it was an umbrella term, like today international law would be. It could mean both treaties and what we would call customer or international law or general international law, uh, natural law. So it was an all-encompassing term for all forms of international law. But it was also a term for what the narrower non-treaty based form. And indeed, you can see this distinction very clearly in the debate about the neutrality proclamation when Washington says he's going to prosecute people for violations of the law of nations. And one of the several objections was, what exactly violation of the law of nations is fitting out these privateers or selling them equipment? And the answer is, oh no, it's a violation of the treaties with France and, uh, and so forth. So there it could mean treaties, but it could also be understood to mean uh, the, uh, um, it could also mean to, uh, to there's a broader category which includes both treaties um, and custom. I think given the uh, specific treaty making power which is vested with the Senate and the specific grant of the power to define and punish law of nations separately from that to Congress suggests that it is actually being broken down into two different units uh, with the treaty making power being given uh, then uh, to the Senate and once that's done Congress uh, can just pass regular laws without any particular define and punish power, and the define and punish power being uh, granted to Congress not including treaties. And I think it's also suggestive that it's coupled together with felonies and piracies against the law of nations, which are kind of common law and non-treaty uh, notions. So I think in the, I mean, it, it, the words could have been used to be, uh, it, could, it could have been in, encompassed treaties, but I don't think on the facts it was, and I think that actually raises some sharp questions for ATS cases about their use of treaties. So I think beca because the treaty power and the, AT uh, uh, and the offenses power are two distinct powers, one given uh, particularly to the Senate, the other to Congress, ATS courts need to be very careful, which they are not, uh, in their use of, let's say, unratified treaties uh, or ratified treaties which Congress has chosen not to subsequently legislate about for building up uh, a law of nations norm, because I see these actually largely um, non-overlapping non -overlap things. David, I have, to, I have to confess, I haven't looked at this nearly as carefully as you have, um, and so mine is sort of an, an yeah. amateur reaction. But you know, it strikes me that I, I'm not. I'm not sold that law of nations in that context would necessarily have excluded treaties, right? As opposed to just meaning an umbrella term that would include. Um, that, that, that could at least in some cases include treaty offenses. But, but one way or the other, it strikes me that there are two, there are two significant implications, right? The first is, um, if I'm not mistaken, there is case law about enforcing treaties through the ATS, right? There's a Seventh Circuit case, I think called Jogi, is that uh, Jogi versus Vodis from a couple of years ago? Um, and so, you know, presumably uh, uh, those cases either um, would turn on that distinction or, or they're wrongly decided. Um, but second, the other thing is, how would that reconcile with Medellin? Right, so you know, if, if if treaties are part of the law of nations, does that include non-self-executing treaties after Medellin, which apparently aren't even treaties for purposes of the supremacy clause? Um, that might be a, a trickier proposition and one that's probably worth sort of more discussion. I want to say one, one more thing. Uh, one of you know, uh, as I'm sure you know, one of the hardest things about uh, legal scholarship is how much of the world one wants to take for granted as a as a constraint, and how much one wants to uh, rethink. So I have thus for, uh, henceforth assumed that law of nations in the ATS 
refers to law of nations in the offenses clause. And I have done so not because I think it's right, but that's what some courts have said without any particular analysis. Actually, in the course of writing my most recent article on this, I've developed significant doubts on what was actually my, on this assumption, which was my assumption for writing the article, based largely on uh, reading the discussion of the offenses clause in Story, St. George Tucker, Kent, and so forth, all of whom say, here's the offenses clause, here's why we need it, so to get us off the hook, and then they say, and here are the examples of what Congress has done to liquidate this power, and they cite several things, they cite the ambassadors, they cite the offenses, uh, the um, uh, safe conduct uh, legislation, they cite the piracy law, basically a bunch of stuff in the First Crimes Act, and they don't mention the ATS, which suggests they did not think of this as maybe offenses clause legislation. What would it then be? Or like everybody else, they forgot about it. Yes. <laughs> well, but, then, but they didn't forget about other equally obscure things like the crimes and no, but story, uh, but, so, but Justice Story would have been intimately familiar with the Crimes Act, right? I mean... And why not the ATS? But they were, they were familiar with it. Yeah. Sure. All right. A question here? Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could um, answer my question on um, the role of uh, uh, public opinion and uh, bad um, corporate reputation in incentivizing uh, quick settlement of some of the cases. When you look at, for example, the Unicol, Myanmar, you look at the Pfizer case, you also look at the, um, the Sarawiwa cases, uh, you, you would notice that they settled, most of the corporations settled. So most people were saying, well, we, can't have, we didn't have an opportunity to actually have precedence. So it actually ties in with your, the issue of precedence here. Um, what role do you see that playing? In other words, the, uh, uh, the threat of uh, uh, bad uh, public opinion and, of, of course, uh, bad reputation in incentivizing corporations, in, especially in those cases, to settle. Now, on the question of uh, courts, um, the, um, the reluctance of courts to hear these cases, I would think that, uh, I think somebody had alluded to that, they're somewhat concerned about frivolous cases, you know, opening up a can of worms, given the nature of this case, and of course it's open for all in terms of aliens, non-aliens, you know, uh, aliens suing, you know, corporations within U.S. So, yeah. So, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't know the answer to the question, but if, if the corporations settled these suits out of the public uh, relations concern, my guess, and I'm not in this business of public relations. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the question is, did they settle to avoid adverse precedent, to not risk a, a large judgment in an unpredictable area of law, or for public relations? I don't know anything about this. I'm not a litigation consultant. But if it was for public relations, based on my personal experience, I would have said they're poorly advised because as someone who writes about the ATS you know, for a living, I have never met a civilian to whom I've said, well, I write about the ATS. They say, oh, like Unicol and those companies in Nigeria and Well, Indonesia. from a law and economics perspective, there are, uh, you know, you do, uh, most corporations do a cost-benefit analysis. Right, so the so question is what's the cost? from a law and cost? economics perspective, an, yeah, an yeah because if, is you, also a cost. if a corporation has the impression that they're going to lose, if you look at the, the, the precedent, if you look at most of the cases, like those cases I mentioned, okay, if, there, if there's an inclination that they may lose in terms of cost benefit analysis, wouldn't they settle yes, out of, of court? Plus, the public opinion, bad reputation, all those things come into equa the equation in deciding whether or not to. So I'm wondering if in your research you've looked at that, because that is actually a factor. You've also mentioned in terms of precedence that there are really no precedence in this. In terms of corporate liability for this aiding and abating, there hasn't been, because it never gets to conclusion. Most of the cases never settle, especially those ones that look like they may lose. They get settled before they get to uh, conclusion. So that's what I'm wondering. Has you, have you looked at that? When I said no precedence, I referred largely to precedence external to ATS cases. That is to say, ATS cases, to see what should be allowable as a norm, need to look outside the universe of okay, ATS Okay, but cases. I'm talking about precedence in terms of corporate liability. Yes. How, do you have any in this area, human rights? No. Exactly. No. So these cases, these three cases in particular, were settled by yeah. co corporations decided to settle. So what role does that play? Corporations are motivated by public opinion, 
um, losses they face in terms of economics. You see, they face some costs in terms of cost-benefit analysis. That factors in. I'm just wondering if you've done that in well, your I mean, research. It, 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 so just, just to tie this all the way back full circle, I mean, it begs the question, why in the world would Shell not have raised this question in the district court? Right? I mean, you know, if, if, if avoiding this kind of litigation is so essential to, to these corporations, if settling versus risking an adverse judgment ends up being so significant, how could they have missed that? Right? And I, I dare say it wasn't for lack of, of high-powered, careful lawyering. Um, right? I, think that, I think it's that you know, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to the corporate liability carve-out issue um, until, you know, in what, footnote 20 of Sosa, Justice Souter dropped this weird hint about how, I don't know, maybe this is a question. Um, so, you know, I think part, it goes back to the, the point, I, the question I raised to Eugene earlier, which is how do you read silence? Do you read silence as suggesting that there's no precedent for this kind of liability, or do you read silence as standing for the proposition that we've never drawn distinctions between natural and juridical people in this context before and shouldn't start doing it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Yeah, over here. Let's flip it a bit to perhaps naive questions from a non-specialist. In, in terms of potential liability of shareholders, if we determine who, who can be sued based on international law, does, does, does the law of nations rep, uh, recognize limited liability? That, that would be a question. And the other, I suppose, is a completely non-U.S. connected person entitled to the protection of the due process clause so that there's a requirement of minimum contacts before they can be hauled into a U.S. court. You want to take the first one, I'll take the second one? Uh, you take the second one, then I'll take the second one. I mean, on, 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 so the first so the first question raises a fascinating point, right? Which is if one really does believe that international law is the only thing we look to for all of these questions, how far down the line does that go? Does international law also provide the only basis for deciding whether the prevailing party is entitled to costs and fees in these cases, right? I mean, is international law the only relevant source of law for every single aspect of the litigation? Well, the basic question, limited liability for sure. Right, exactly. And so, right, so if, if then the corporation tries to pass along whatever the damages judgment is to its shareholders, could the shareholder turn around and say, no, you don't, look at international law. Um, this is part of why I think this is all a little bit of over-inflation uh, of, of what is a relatively straightforward question and why federal common law, I think, is ultimately the answer. Um, as for the second constitutional question, um, so I am one of those who doesn't think um, that Eisentrager or Kiyum, that Eisentrager actually said the due process clause doesn't protect any non-citizen ever outside the territory of the United States. Um, but I think, you know, if a, in the context where a foreign corporation was being hailed into a domestic court, you know, I, I think it would be hard for the court to then turn around and say, but you don't get protected by the due process clause. Once you're in a federal court in the United States, I have to think there's a much stronger argument for the due process clause, even if you thought it didn't otherwise protect that corporation. Uh, I think, actually, believe it or not, the Fifth Circuit has addressed this question and said, no, the due process clause does not apply or is presumed to be waived. Uh, and they did this in a strange circumstance called the Maritime Drug Law Enforcement Act, uh, which make, applies universal jurisdiction, quite astonishingly, to drug trafficking, which is clearly not a universal jurisdiction crime. And this is a problem. And the, so, so someone raised a, a Fifth Amendment due process argument and said, I was a you know, Colombian taking drugs from one Latin American country to another, was picked up on the high seas by the Coast Guard, which is how these things happen, and here I am in Texas, uh, raised a Fifth Amendment argument. And the court, incorrectly, I think, basically called this a universal jurisdiction offense because all countries condemn it, which does not universal jurisdiction make. But they said it is universal jurisdiction. And so the fact, the fact that it is universal jurisdiction kind of trumps, overrides, or automatically satisfies, whichever way you want to have it, Fifth Amendment concerns, because you were on notice that like everyone doesn't like drugs, so you were going to be tried somewhere. And so you can't complain, oh, what is this? I'm being tried about drugs. You know that no one likes this, so somewhere you will be, uh, you will be tried. But again, for that to happen, so I think the, uh, the Fifth Amendment is satisfied in this view if it's a universal jurisdiction offense, but then that gets to the question, is it really universally cognizable? Or is it just things that countries think are international law offenses, which is not the same thing? Or, even on a lower level, just things that countries think are bad and not even international law offenses? And what about the first question about the relevance of international law and limited liability? 
Oh, so yeah, obvi obviously international law. Yeah, I, 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 I will fall back on my earlier comments. Obviously international law is deficient and vague. Uh, I'll, I'll say that over and over. Uh, that is to say, there will be gaps, uh, but federal common law, that, that doesn't mean the alternative is federal common law, because often international law is not deficient and vague. See aiding and abetting, where often particular mens there's a particular international law mens rea, attempts, etc. Uh, and again, it does get back to the question of silence. Okay. Uh, yeah, back here. Can you wait for the mic? It's right behind you. There you go. Forgive me, I'm a layman, I'm not a lawyer. However, uh, I do write extensively about legal issues. Uh, was anyone, or, uh, and during any of the waves of asbestos litigation, was the uh, Alien Tort Statute involved in any of those uh, issues at all? Yes, Judge, uh, Judge Weinstein was involved greatly in both of them, in that sense, in that they were done by the same person, some of the major cases. But otherwise, no. No. But, yeah, yeah conceptually. <laughs> A stretch. All right, here. Um, question. Thank you very much. Would you comment on the relationships between ETS and sovereign immunity? Sure. I mean, so sovereign immunity under federal law is governed by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, right? And so presumably um, the FSIA would, would override any attempt to sue a, a foreign sovereign uh, under the ATS unless you could show that one of the exceptions to the FSIA applied. So, you know, it seems to me that that's actually a relatively straightforward question. Um, the, I, I think the assumption has always been, maybe it's Amrata Hess, I think, that says this, um, that you can't, in fact, sue uh, a foreign sovereigns under the ATS because of, you know, the sort of lack of over, the lack of sort of carve out in the FSIA. So, you know, I don't think there's a question that, that, there's, that, that the ATS can't be used to sue a foreign sovereign. I think Amrata has settled that. Yeah, and just to add, I agree entirely with Stephen, just to add uh, one, uh, one little wrinkle. It probably is federal, the Federal Sovereign Immunities Act, which has given rise to the question of corporate liability, in that the difficulty of suing sovereigns and sovereign actors in the so-called first wave of ATS uh, litigation led to the subsequent waves and turning the focus towards more susceptible uh, defendants. I think we have time for one more question, and then I'm going to give our speakers a minute to, a couple minutes to wrap up. Is there another question? I, I don't know if I have a minute. <laughs> All right, you have two minutes. <laughs> so I, I, I think one of the puzzles of figuring out rules here is that the federal courts are applying rules of international law, rules of the law of nations, and supposedly vindicating these international norms, which are not vindicated in a similar way in any other nation in the world. And when one gets to the question of, well, what exactly are all the subsidiary rules, universal jurisdiction, corporate liability, and it turns out one reason it's so hard to answer these questions is because we are the only country doing this. And I think, but, but I think uh, that it should be a serious problem for the very first step of SOSA, now, if SOSA means, in Hamdan's terms, you need clear precedence, that's going to greatly limit the stock of possible causes of action. Again, it won't entirely foreclose it, so piracy is something, attacks on ambassadors is something, but even moving broader, yeah, uh, torture, uh, torture and so forth, so uh, that, cl that, that clearly exists. Uh, I'll say one thing about the SOSA causes of action, piracy, um, attacks on ambassadors and safe conducts which I think hasn't been generally appreciated. Sosa says, look, it, uh, they intended to allow for causes of action for those three things because Blackstone mentions them in his commentaries on the laws of England as things that were incorporated into the British common law. Maybe, but they were also actually not incorporated into the US common law. They were actually made federal crimes in the first Crimes Act. So those three things which the ATS would have provided a civil, civil remedy for were things that were actually criminalized by Congress, and that would have avoided any question about federal courts engaged in a free-form effort to define international law offenses because they were already defined with great specificity by Congress. The federal court would not have had to ask, offenses against ambassadors, does that include to, uh, the ambassador's servant? Well, what about the servant's servant? All those things were actually addressed in the statute with some degree of specificity, 
And so the ATS, if it was for those three things, what it was then really was a, a civil parallel, a civil remedy for existing criminalized things. And I think that would give a very definite and easily comprehensible scope to the ATS today. There are federal crimes that track international law, war crimes and so forth. Congress has defined torture uh, in a statute. So as providing a civil remedy that tracks things that Congress has criminalized in reliance on international law would get us off the hook for a lot of these questions, help us know when we could use federal common law and when we couldn't, uh, and, and make this a lot more tractable, albeit more narrow. Um, I, you know, I don't have much to add to what we said. I, I think that's just, it's important to appreciate the extent to which um, the conversation about the scope of the law of nations in the ATS context actually dovetails with the conversation about Congress's power in the military commissions context. Um, and so I think, you know, we're not going to, we're going to agree to disagree about what international law is, how we define it, um, how much federal courts should be uh, entitled to sort of enforce it as federal common law. I think the critical point is whatever your bottom line ends up being, how, whatever your view is, presumably that should have just as much to say about your view of Congress's power to define offenses against the law of nations. Um, and that I think, you know, folks are going to sort of cash out differently on the answer to that question, but I think it's very difficult to be simultaneously very um, narrow in your view of what the ATS encompasses um, and very broad in your view of what Congress can subject to trial by military commission because they really do, to my mind, come from the very same place. So when the Second Circuit in Talisman Energy says, oh, well, conspiracy isn't recognized as a standalone offense under international law, therefore conspiracy can't be the basis for liability under the ATS, um, I turn around and say, well, why isn't the same thing true about conspiracy as a war crime tribal by a military commission? Now, the answer may be that Congress is entitled to at least some discretion in going past the law of nations, right? That defining and punishing allows Congress to go a step past what the law of nations means as an abstraction when Congress merely incorporates it in the statute. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable position. But then the critical question becomes, how far can Congress go, um, right? Just how much discretion is Congress entitled to? Um, and I think the, you know, especially where sort of military commissions are concerned, or on the flip side, where, you know, corporate liability for human rights abuses is concerned, there are reasons to want Congress to have to be sort of carefully circumscribed in its authority. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. We'll wait for clarity from the Supreme Court and then take up the <laughs> conversation at Trace Conference this spring. Please join me in welcoming and, and thanking our speakers. They're very <laughs>